I've finally made it into the billion dollar safe house, but danger is creeping closer with every step. Riding snowmobiles, Sue Howe and I arrive at Lark Manor, drawing the attention of the neighbors in the community. Meanwhile, a well dressed, curvy beauty gazes intently at us through her window. She's run out of food three days ago, and her remaining coal for heat won't last much longer. To survive, she must find a way to make us listen and bring her food. If you've missed any previous chapters, the link is in the description below. Be sure to catch up. Alright folks, let's set our sights high today. Our goal is 500 likes. Hit that like button and subscribe right now. As we stand in front of Wong Simon's residence, I raise my weapon, pointing it at Su Hao's head, urging him to open the door quickly. Su Hao rushes to the security camera, yelling for Wong Simon to let us in. Inside, Wong Simon sips on his 1982 Lafitte and watches the security monitor, puzzled by our unexpected visit. He scans the area but doesn't spot the snowmobile we mentioned, suspecting a trick. As I grow impatient, I threaten Su Hao with the gun, warning him not to dare trick me. Believe it or not, I'll shoot you right now, I declare angrily. Sweat pours down Su Hao's face as he pleads with me, begging me not to shoot. He assures me he wouldn't dare deceive me even if he had the guts. Then, he addresses the camera, speaking to Wong Simon. Su Hao emphasizes how hard we've worked and how crucial it is not to fail now. He stresses that missing this opportunity would mean losing the chance for another store. Convinced of their sincerity, Wong Simon decides on a ruthless contingency plan. If they betray us, he'll activate a mechanism to obliterate them, leaving nothing behind but ashes. With a press of a button, the main door of the villa swings open, revealing the spacious interior. Su Hao and I enter, marveling at the opulence around us. Su Hao remarks on the lavishness of rich people, noting how they have countless ways to entertain themselves. He points out a passage ahead, suggesting we explore further to find another door leading to the shelter. I follow closely behind, letting Su Hao take the lead. Unbeknownst to us, Wong Simon watches through the surveillance cameras, waiting for the opportune moment to spring his trap. As I step into the range of his trap, he wastes no time activating it. Suddenly, exhaust ports above the corridor open, releasing a suffocating gas. Su Hao reacts quickly, covering his nose and mouth, but I remain calm. I've already devised a countermeasure. Not stopping there, Wong Simon activates a sleeping gas mechanism, engulfing us in a cloud of smoke. But I stay composed, knowing I have a plan to deal with this too. The two of us are going all out in our act to trick Wong Simon. I shout at Su Hao, you mongrel, open the door for me now. Su Hao retorts, stop struggling Zhang Yi, you're a fool. Even if you kill me, you won't survive. Then, two gunshots ring out in the smoke. Excitedly, Wong Simon watches the two figures in the smoke, thinking, these two idiots who came to my door, do they actually think they can beat me? Let's see how I take care of them. Seizing the opportunity, I draw the smoke into my own alternate space. The voices of the two gradually fade in the smoke, and the passage door slowly opens. Calmly, I put away my gas mask, thinking that as soon as Wong Simon walks in, I'll immediately shoot him. Footsteps approach, and I can hardly contain my excitement. But to my dismay, it's not Wong Simon who walks in, it's Ling. Su Hao you idiot, why are there other people in the shelter? Ignoring that for now, I continue to play dead until Ling Gang comes closer and lifts both of us onto his shoulders, heading toward the passage door. Only then do I realize that this person is Ling Gang from the entertainment industry, who is said to have a good relationship with Wong Simon. Ling Gang dumps the two of us in front of Wong Simon, who looks at the unconscious pair. Ling Gang ties our arms behind our backs, saying, this guy is as stupid as a pig, he's no effort at all, and he even dared to target your shelter. Wong Simon responds nonchalantly, well, isn't this to be expected? If I can't even handle some popper, then my billion dollar shelter is a waste. The two start discussing how to snag my snowmobile since they haven't left the shelter in ages. Wong Simon's getting antsy cooped up like this. As they chat, I activate a hidden space and let out some hypnotic gas. They're so hyped up they start swaying. Wong Simon gives Ling Gang a puzzled look saying, if you're pumped to go out, why are you wobbling? Ling Gang, in a daze, replies, brother Wong, I'm not wobbling. Why do I see six of you then? They both collapse, and I silently untie the ropes, thinking it was a piece of cake. I pick up Wong Simon's fancy gold handgun, chuckling at the flashy toys rich folks have. But they're all for show. With Wong Simon and the others handled, I start snooping around the rooms. Let's see what goodies the wealthy hoard. Each room blows my mind. Luxury beyond imagination. I stumble upon a room full of lush greenery. A whole ecosystem in here. I smirk, claiming this place is mine. Room after room, labeled for games, pets, and entertainment, I explore. Then, I stumble into a water bedroom with seductive women lounging around. Sadly, they're all lifeless. Heading to the basement, room designated for pets, I'm shocked to find playboy bunnies and cat women covered in strange fluids and needles. One of them pleads for more, but I don't need this. I kick her away and put an end to them all. Moving on to the control room, hoping it's the shelter's core, I realize I'm no computer expert. Discovering sports facilities, I see potential for testing my skills in the future. 
Continuing my patrol, I encounter a room where the system denies access due to failed identity verification. Can't pass through this area. I'll need Master Wong's help after all, I think, before splashing water on the two men to wake them up. Sweetheart, Zhang Yi says mockingly. At this point, Wang Simon looks at me in disbelief. How did you do this, Zhang Yi? I smile slightly. The rich rely on technology. We poor folks rely on mutations. How else would we survive in the AP apocalypse? I point my weapon at Wang Simon. All right, my lord. Now is not the time for chit-chat. Let's get down to business. I lean down. For example, how about letting me live comfortably in this villa? That's the only way you'll save your life. Wang Simon visibly tenses. I'll give you whatever you want. Just let me go, he pleads. Calm down, I reassure him. Don't worry. I don't have a habit of killing. I just want to find a stable place to live. Your place is so big, one more person won't make a difference. Wang Simon looks at me skeptically. You just want to move in? You don't want to kill me and take over? I chuckle, thinking that killing you would be pointless. Besides, I'm not a murderer, and this snow disaster won't last forever. Once things return to normal, I'd like to be on good terms with you. Upon hearing this, Wang Simon perks up thinking, so this bumpkin wants to be friends with me? In their eyes, society will eventually return to normal, and with a little help from me, these country bumpkins can rise to the top. They sure know how to plan, but I'm no pushover either. If you want to be friends, hurry up and untie me. My hands are numb, I tell him, smiling. But there's a condition. He has to hand over control of the shelter systems to me. Wong Simon hesitates, but eventually agrees. I grandly sweep my hand over the control panel, proclaiming, from now on, I'm the master here. Wong Simon, beside me, eagerly acknowledges my new status, pleading to be untied, as his whole body is numb. But ominously, I stand up, telling him to hold on for a second. I'll relieve you shortly, I say as I take out a knife from behind me and slash it across Wong Simon's neck in a flash. Blood spurts out, and he looks at me in disbelief. You promised not to kill me. You broke your word, he accuses. I look at him mockingly, saying, relax. You might feel a bit dizzy at first, but the pain will be over soon. Wong Simon falls to the ground, passing away to the afterlife. As I scrub the blood off the floor, I ponder how to handle Su Hao's involvement in Wong Simon's demise. Resolving one issue, I still wrestle with what to do about Su Hao, considering he did aid me in seizing Wong Simon's residence. Suddenly, Su Hao stirs, groggy from his slumber, and notices me cleaning the bloodstains. Excitedly he exclaims, Bro Zhang, we did it, didn't we? He rises and gazes upon Wong Simon's lifeless body on the floor, mocking him with laughter. I never thought this day would come for you, you damn dog. Not killing you myself was too merciful. I gesture towards a backpack on the sofa, informing Su Hao that his reward lies within. Eagerly he opens it to find an assortment of food, his eyes lighting up with delight as he begins to feast. Bro Zhang, you're like a brother to me. I'll follow you wherever you go. Your word is law, he declares. However, I dampen his enthusiasm, explaining that Wang Simon's shelter is nearly depleted of resources and energy. Su Hao becomes anxious, refusing to believe that this is all that remains. Accusing me of monopolizing everything and intending to kick him out, he asserts his importance in providing intel on the shelter. I chuckle at his accusations, assuring him that I have no reason to lie. Despite his threats to expose my abilities, I remain unfazed by his attempts to manipulate the situation. I've been too soft on you, he declares, lifting his hand and aiming at Su Hao. I gave you a chance, but you blew it. What good are you to me now? Su Hao collapses to the ground, bewildered by the sudden turn of events. As he takes his last breath, I gaze at him and mutter, be better in your next life. Empty threats won't get you far without power. With a sigh, I grab my backpack. I plan to let you live a little longer, but you've pushed me too far. Sitting in the entertainment area, I let my mind wander. It would be nice to survive here until the apocalypse blows over. It might even be fun if Dr. Ju were here with me. As for uncle, I have different plans in store for him. I pour myself a glass of red wine and turn on the TV, only to be surprised by the sight of a foreign woman on the screen. Switching through various international channels, I wonder how Wong Simon managed to pull this off during the storm. After some pondering, I stumble upon a hidden door connected to a network of cables. Inside, I discover an independent server. My eyes light up with excitement. With this high-end network infrastructure, I can now access accurate information from around the world in no time. Settling in, I begin to browse through the data. In just one month, the world's population has dwindled to a mere quarter of its former size, 8.5 billion people reduced to a fraction. Zhang Yi feels grateful for stocking up on supplies ahead of time. He hopes at least 5% of the population can survive in the future. However, his optimism wavers when he comes across reports of mutated humans. Many countries have reported individuals with both beneficial and harmful mutations. Some can conjure flames or summon bears, while others transform into towering green giants. Yet, only a few possess special abilities. Most are physically deformed by gamma radiation. After digesting this information, Zhang Yi becomes convinced that there are others like him hiding their true strength. This realization deepens his understanding of the dangers lurking outside. Determined to stay in the shelter, 
he plans to retrieve Dr. Zhou, his loyal companion, from the safe house. As Zhang Yi prepares to depart on his snowmobile, he is interrupted by an enchanting voice. Instantly alert, he aims his gun at the newcomer, only to be surprised by the sight of the renowned actress Yang Mi. She, who has captivated the entertainment world, stands before him, pleading to be taken away from the harsh snowstorm. Observing Yang Mi's soft demeanor, Zhang Yi reflects on the hardships faced by everyone. If you want me to take you, he responds, you need to give me a good reason. In a tender tone, Yang Mi agrees to any condition in exchange for food. Then she seals the deal with a kiss on Zhang Yi's cheek, leaving him blushing and won over by her charm. I pondered the idea of having another woman to share the bed during this chaotic time. It didn't seem like a bad idea in the apocalypse. As I escorted her to my new place, Yang Mi couldn't help but notice my skills as we entered Wang Xing's residence. Putting on a surprised act, she inquired about the connection between me and Wang Xing. I avoided her question, instead cautiously asking if she was acquainted with Wang Simon. If she had any ties with him, I knew I had to act fast to avoid future trouble. Yang Mi changed her tone, claiming she didn't really know Wang Simon well, just the usual nods and greetings at events. Pouring tea, I thought it was a smart move to let her off the hook for now. Handing her the tea, I made it clear that this place was now mine, and she shouldn't ask questions she had no business asking. Yang Mi eagerly gulped down the tea, relishing its warmth, mentioning it was the first cup of hot water she'd had in days. Then she coyly asked if she could use the bathroom for a hot shower. I naturally didn't refuse. As she undressed and left her clothes in the living room, she indulged in the longest hot shower, her body instantly relaxing. Meanwhile, she began to plot how to make me serve under her. With her beauty, she figured it wouldn't be hard to win me over. Compared to the greasy middle-aged men she knew, I was quite the catch in her eyes. She believed her good luck hadn't run out yet, even if she had to be with me for a few months. After her shower, Yang Mi walks out barefoot, determined to do whatever it takes to stay. She's crystal clear about what comes next and mentally gears up, reminding herself it's just a transaction. Once the snowstorm blows over and life goes back to normal, she'll still be a top-tier celebrity, and no one will be any the wiser about this little arrangement. Wrapped in a towel, she saunters over to Jiang Yi, coyly asking if she can crash at his place. She sweetens the deal, promising to serve him well if he agrees. But when Jiang Yi remains unmoved, she grabs his hand and pleads, assuring him she won't be any trouble and will leave quietly once the storm passes. Jiang Yi, however, sees through her facade, realizing she views his place as a mere stepping stone. He takes a sip of red wine and quips sarcastically, questioning whether the world will ever return to its former state, even after the snowstorm. Yang Mi suddenly grows anxious, desperately asserting that things can go back to normal, as if trying to reassure herself. Uninterested in arguing, Zhang Yi lays down the law, declaring that if she's staying in his house, she'll play by his rules. Zhang Yi pulls Yang Mi close, whispering that he understands she doesn't have to wait anymore now that she's with him. He sees no reason to refuse her request. Afterward, Zhang Yi takes out clothing from a different dimension and tosses it to Yang Mi leaving her dumbfounded. She wonders what kind of superpower allows him to summon objects out of thin air. As she's about to turn away, Yang Mi grabs his arm, pleading for him to stay. Zhang Yi, amused, teases her, suggesting she's not satisfied yet. He mentions having other things to attend to but promises to deal with her later that night. Yang Mi blushes and clarifies that she has something important to discuss with him. Feeling a bit hungry, Zhang Yi suggests they talk over dinner. Yang Mi obediently sits at the dining table as Zhang Yi summons food from another dimension. He casually mentions that adding one more woman won't make a difference in his large home, but lays down one requirement, she must obey him. Yang Mi, knowing the game, agrees but also sets some principles she hopes he'll respect. Zhang Yi, amused, agrees to hear her out. Yang Mi states her first condition, whatever happens between them must stay between them during the snowstorm period. She emphasizes the importance of protecting her reputation as a public figure. Zhang Yi, understanding her concerns, readily agrees to keep their affairs private. Summoning her courage, Yang Mi states her second condition, Zhang Yi can't force her into uncomfortable situations or make outrageous demands unless she agrees. Blushing and shifting awkwardly, she explains her boundaries. Zhang Yi, feeling puzzled, questions her sudden change in attitude, reminding her that she was the one who approached him initially. He's not naive either and pulls her close, not buying her innocent act, especially since she's an actress. He brings up the concept of quid pro quo, wondering how she became a top-tier celebrity with such poor acting skills. Yang Mi falls silent, unable to respond to Zhang Yi's rebuke. He then lifts her up and places her on the dining table, whispering in her ear reassuringly, Don't worry, I don't have any weird fetishes, but thanks for the reminder. Yang Mi, having seen far more bizarre behavior in her industry, finds Zhang Yi's behavior quite reasonable.
They spend the night discussing a script in great detail. Early the next morning, as Zhang Yi prepares to leave, he suddenly remembers that his friend, Uncle Yu, is still single. He asks Yang Mi if most of the people living here are wealthy women or celebrities, to which she nods in agreement. Zhang Yi smiles and mentions that he has a friend who's a good person, but recently got cheated by a scheming woman. He suggests that his friend could use some female companionship to heal his wounded heart, and asks if Yang Mi could help find someone suitable in her circle. Upon hearing this, Yang Mi looks surprised. What are you taking me for? She thinks quickly, realizing that she's the only younger woman left in the neighborhood. Zhang Yi recalls that Uncle Yu prefers mature women, so Yang Mi eagerly suggests, that makes things simple. She promptly contacts the famous Shuaim. Zhang Yi brightens up at the mention of her name. Damn Uncle Yu, you owe me big time, he mutters. Shuaim is a dream woman for many. Yang Mi promises her a feast if she agrees to spend time with Uncle. You considering her hunger, Shuaim agrees without further ado. Zhang Yi produces food from another dimension, and Shuam starts eating voraciously. Zhang Yi looks at both women. We're all smart people here. From now on, I'll take care of your food. But if anyone leaks information from here, forget about food, you'll owe me your life. With that, he leaves to transfer useful items and people, including Zhou Er and Uncle Yu, to his current location. In another village called Su Family Town, young folks are hard at work drilling through the ice layer underground while sled dogs race ahead. Suddenly, there's a loud noise as they break through and small fish leap out. The workers swiftly gather the fish, showing their skill. One young man asks the elder if he thinks city folks might have frozen to death in this cold. The elder scoffs, saying those city folks don't know the first thing about farming and rely on them for food. He reckons they're probably starving or worse. Thankfully, rural folks like them have some food reserves and resilience to weather the cold. Just then, a rumbling noise in the distance catches their attention, making the elder alert. It's rare to see anyone out in this cold. Could it be the sound of a snowmobile? Suddenly, Zhang Yi zooms by on his snowmobile, surprised to see the villagers fishing by breaking the ice. He also notices their sleds, and is impressed by how quickly they've adapted to the icy conditions. If he hadn't witnessed it himself, he would have thought Eskimos had moved to Sioux Family Town. The villagers spot me on my snowmobile, which they see as the equivalent of a Rolls Royce in the snowy environment. Without a word, they urge their sled dogs to chase, sending them into a frenzy. I panic and quickly throttle up, speeding away. Meanwhile, on the river, eight dogs are chasing me down, tongues out and eyes turning red at the sight of me. If they catch me, I'm definitely in trouble. Suddenly, a fisherman hurls a harpoon towards me. Furious, I think, damn it. If that harpoon hits my arm, it would either injure or kill me. I swerve sharply, and due to the inertia, Kaim is flung off. The fishermen catch up and confront me, demanding that I leave the woman and the snowmobile. Coldly, I look at them and swiftly pull out a handgun, aiming it at them. The fishermen suddenly get nervous. Hey, let's chat. No need for weapons here. Despite the snowmobile's beauty, they're hesitant to let me pass through their family territory without paying a toll. Leave the woman or the vehicle. It's your call, Shinani sneers. What if I don't want either? I retort. The fisherman's demeanor shifts, warning me that even a gun won't help against their numbers. Knowing I need to act fast before more villagers arrive, I take a deep breath and mutter, you leave me no choice. Drawing another weapon, I prepare for the confrontation. As the situation escalates, I raise both guns and fire, knocking down several from Sioux Family Town. Uncle Sue is shocked at my seriousness and commands the ferocious dogs to attack. But I'm ready. With a swift motion, I activate another dimension, trapping all eight dogs. Seizing the opportunity, I grab Shame, start the snowmobile, and speed off. Glancing back at the approaching villagers, I know escaping won't be easy with them on my tail. Phew, that was a close call. Almost got bitten by those mad dogs. Good thing I used the other dimension as a weapon. Those dogs will suffocate soon enough in that space. It also gives me a chance to measure the time flow difference between the other dimension and the real world. As the villagers arrive, they're shocked to see the dead bodies on the ground. We've encountered a tough one, they say, but their concern deepens when they realize that our eight snow dogs are missing. It's strange because those dogs were well trained and wouldn't stray without orders. Losing four lives is bad enough, but now eight snow dogs have vanished too. We're in big trouble. The leader speaks up. This person not only had a gun and a snowmobile, but also killed so many people from Sioux Family Town. He must be extraordinary. Maybe he even has superpowers, like our villager Chumley. Let's not act recklessly. Go back and consult with the village head returning to Sioux Family Town. The village head gathers a group and goes to Chumley who is found sleeping soundly, clutching a 2D anime doll. The village head becomes red-faced upon seeing a room full of 2D dolls, and scold Chumley. You're a grown man king. Fake dolls, aren't you? Shamed our village girls are far more beautiful than these dolls. Chumley stretches lazily. Grandpa, your way. Off base are the village women, even to be called young ladies. Besides, it's my hobby. Why do you care now? What do you want Sue to high under jacks this morning? We encountered a young man. While fishing he killed four of us and took our snow dogs. The man was incredibly powerful. He might have superpowers like you. 
our village may no longer be safe, Chumley thinks, we've just ended fights with nearby villages, and now this, when will we have some peace? Meanwhile Zhang Yi safely drops Zhou Haim at the base of an apartment complex leading the away Zhang Yai, says the man you will meet is in this building, come upstairs with me, H. Hei agrees although reluctantly in this apocalyptic world, having someone to team up with isn't a bad choice. As Zhang Yi steps into the safe house, Dr. Zhou beams with joy, feeling like a kid on Christmas morning. Congratulations on making it back safely, she exclaims, eager to help him out of his coat. But when she notices the woman behind him, a sense of unease creeps in. Ignoring Dr. Zhou's fussing, Zhang Yi politely asks her to take a seat first. Dr. Zhou, with her intuition on high alert, senses something different about Zhang Yi. I get it now. You prefer mature women, don't you? She ventures, surprised by her own insight. Zhang Yi chuckles softly, confirming her observation. Don't read too much into it. This woman is here to take care of Uncle Yu, he reassures her. But Dr. Zhu remains focused on Uncle Yu's condition, quickly updating Zhang Yi on his recovery progress. Uncle Yu has mostly recovered miraculously, thanks to your instructions, she explains. But his strength seems unaffected by the muscle relaxant I gave him. Zhang Yi nods knowingly, confirming his suspicion of Uncle Yu's mutation. Concerned, he inquires about Uncle Yu's mental state. After a moment of contemplation, Dr. Zhu assures him, he seems fine. No issues with his mental state have been detected. Hearing this, I stroke my chin. I've read online about people experiencing dangerous physical mutations after gaining superpowers. I'm glad Uncle Yu didn't go through that. I then visit Uncle Yu's room and see that he's fine, which eases my concerns. I also tell him about capturing Wang Simon's shelter the day before. Upon hearing this, Uncle Yu remarks, rich people sure know how to have fun. I calmly respond, there are plenty of wealthy people both domestically and internationally, and many of them would have built shelters. In that sense, it's easier for the rich and powerful to survive in this post-apocalyptic world. Uncle Yu lowers his head. Zhang Yi, how can I ever thank you? I wouldn't be alive now if it wasn't for you. My eyes flicker slightly, no need for formalities. By the way Uncle, you, have you noticed any changes in your body these past few days? Uncle Yu lifts a hand. It's strange. With such severe gunshot wounds, it should take months to heal. But I've recovered in just a few days, and my strength has increased tremendously. He lifts a sofa next to him with one hand. I look at Uncle Yu with delighted astonishment. What incredible strength. Uncle Yu looks at himself puzzled, feeling like some kind of monster. I reassure him cheerfully. Don't worry too much. You've just awakened a powerful ability. It's like a tadpole successfully transforming into a frog. Uncle, you stared at me, bewildered. I flashed a smile, telling him not to be surprised. I've awakened some abilities. As I pulled out some food from another dimension, Uncle Yu was completely dumbfounded. It suddenly clicked why I always seem to have endless resources. With a strong push, he overturned the bed and then heavily fell to the ground. I advised him to get used to his new body before making any moves. Seeing him in this condition, I was overjoyed. The stronger Uncle Yu becomes, the safer I'll be. Meanwhile, Dr. Zhou and the superstar Zhou Haim were busy in the living room. I got back to the point with Uncle Yu. I found him a wife. He glanced at Zhou Haim in disbelief. This was every man's dream goddess. Zhou Haim approached and greeted Uncle Yu with a smile, saying hello. Elated, Uncle Yu nodded furiously. His dream goddess was actually speaking to him. I looked at both of them, and, given the exceptional circumstances, suggested they pair up and live together. I'd leave the house to both of them while Dr. Zhu and I would move out. Uncle, you seem worried, I said to him, noticing his anxious expression. This can't continue. You've already done so much for me, and this house is your sanctuary. I can't just take it from you. But uncle reassured me, urging me not to be so formal. You found a better place? I asked, surprised. You can bring your wife to visit any time. After settling things with uncle, we headed downstairs to our new home. Then, as a wedding gift, I presented him with a snowmobile from another space. He was astonished, refusing to accept it, worried about what I'd do without it. But I insisted, saying, don't worry uncle, I'll manage without it. Then, to everyone's surprise, I revealed an off-road snow vehicle from another space. Their speechlessness made me wonder if this was what I meant by managing. Meanwhile, in Sioux family town, there's widespread anxiety as everyone waits for the village's star of hope. Chumley, to make a decision. Chumley believes he's destined for greatness, seeing it as a sign from the heavens to become stronger. The village head expresses concern, acknowledging Chumley's strength and the challenge he poses. Chumley assures them, feeling the weight of their expectations, but confident in his abilities. In another part of town, Zhang Yi and Dr. Zhou are on their way to their new villa in an off-road vehicle. Dr. Zhou, curious about their new home, questions Zhang Yi's decision to leave their secure house. Zhang Yi reassures her, explaining that their new home is much more comfortable and spacious. However, he surprises her with news of another person joining them. Dr. Zhou becomes nervous, fearing it might be another woman, but Zhang Yi assures her it's just someone to help with their responsibilities. Dr. Zhou relaxes, feeling reassured and snuggling closer to Zhang Yi, expressing her love for him. 
Zhang Yi smiles, accepting the situation, and drives onward through the intensifying snowstorm, determined to face whatever challenges lie ahead. The wind, even fiercer than at the start of the snowstorm, suddenly whirls around, hitting the back of the off-road vehicle. I quickly sense that something's off, this snow is too unnatural. Then, a loud bang as a gust of wind slams into the vehicle, causing it to swerve off track. Gripping the wheel tightly, I step on the gas, urging Dr. Zhu to hold on tight. I extend my left hand, creating a different space with a whoosh, sucking in the attacking snowstorm. Damn, it's a tornado. Heavenly K City hasn't seen one in centuries. This is definitely an attack, not a natural disaster. I calm myself, relying on my ultimate defense ability. As long as I don't panic, the opponent won't be able to kill me. I start to think, realizing that the attacker must be nearby. Skillfully, I turn the vehicle around and once again create a different space, sucking in the attacking tornado. Meanwhile, lurking in the shadows, Chumley senses that something's amiss. The tornado had struck the vehicle, but why did it suddenly stop? It drains a lot of his energy, and he's unsure of how strong the other party is. The more he thinks, the more he believes this guy isn't easy to deal with. He might have superpowers too. Worst of all, he's already revealed his trump card but knows nothing about the other person. Two villagers stand by my side, sensing that something's wrong. Chumley, what's up? Why didn't your superpower work this time? I ask. Chumley curses. Damn, we've hit a tough spot. We need to find another plan. Let's retreat for now. Meanwhile, I'm in the vehicle, armed and ready for action. I grab a sniper rifle with a high magnification scope from a different space. You think you can attack me and get away? I challenge. With determination, I lift the rifle and take aim, firing two shots. One of the villagers falls to the ground. Chumley and the other villager are stunned. How could I hit from such a distance? It seems impossible. I raise the rifle again, and Chumley hides behind a snow mountain, terrified. I smirk. Since you're hiding, let me return the favor. With a flick of my left hand, I release the absorbed tornado back out. Chumley watches in shock as a tornado identical to his own superpower forms. He realizes I have the same ability as him. As he's about to be swept up, Chumley gathers his strength and unleashes his power again. The two tornadoes collide and cancel each other out. Seizing the chance, Chumley escapes. I watch them retreat and decide to let them go for now. I can't risk chasing them into the villagers' territory, especially with Dr. Ju in the car. A small mistake could lead to disaster. If they want revenge, they can find me. But next time, it'll be on my turf. I don't waste time dwelling on it. Instead, I keep driving towards Lark Manor. During the journey, I realize I've gained valuable insights from this battle. The future seems destined to be ruled by those with superpowers. Dr. Joe, concerned about potential revenge attacks, asks about our safety. I reassure her, stating that our new refuge is highly secure. Even a superpower like a tornado wouldn't affect us. Elsewhere, Sue, Depan, and the others help the injured make their way to Sue Family Town. Since my superpower awakened, I've been the one doing the attacking. It's a first for someone to chase and attack me. It was a close call, and I'm grateful to be alive. Yang Mi, clad in alluring lingerie, lounges on the bed, feeling out of place in her new role as a kept woman. As she ponders how to pass the time, the door clicks open, and in walks Zhang Yi, prompting her to sit up. He announces his intention to introduce her to a friend, sparking Yang Mi's concern. Is he planning to pass her off to someone else? Zhang Yi chuckles at her reaction, clarifying that the friend is just someone who came first. Yang Mi, still puzzled, questions if the friend is his girlfriend, to which Zhang Yi cryptically responds, close enough. Feeling a surge of competition, Yang Mi resolves not to be outdone, especially by someone she considers beneath her status. As she applies her makeup with precision, she vows to maintain her poise and not let herself be overshadowed. Meanwhile, Dr. Ju meticulously prepares herself, recognizing the power of a woman's charm in any competition. As both women gear up for the encounter, the tension rises. Finally, after much preparation, Yang Mi enters the living room, only to be met with shock and dismay as she locks eyes with Dr. Zhou. The realization hits them both, they know each other. In the midst of their silent confrontation, Zhang Yi stands clueless in the middle, prompting Dr. Zhu to angrily reveal their familial connection. Sensing the strained atmosphere, Yang Mi pulls Zhang Yi aside and urges him to keep their relationship a secret from Dr. Zhou, revealing the complexities of their entangled situation. Zhang Yi scratches his chin and grins at us. Yang Mi instantly gets mad. The deal between us puts Zhang Yi in an interesting spot. He glances at a furious Dr. Zhou and a wary Mi. Turns out, both the Zhou and Young families are known for their smarts, boasting loads of talented folks. Yang Mi picks showbiz to get famous, aiming to be an actress. Dr. Zhou gives her a disdainful look. If you had real talent, you'd make it on your own. No one in our family would hesitate. Do you know why you're infamous? You're like a public bus everyone knows. It's pretty nauseating to hear. 
Zhang Yi finds Yi's expression behind him kind of funny and waves it off. I don't care about your old grudges. We're all just neighbors now, facing the same tough times. Reluctantly, the two women shake hands, agreeing to live and let live. Then, Zhang Yi leads them to the underground garden, bursting with veggies and plants. He lays down their daily tasks. Besides chores, they gotta take care of these plants to keep things running smoothly. Neither of them are thrilled, but they're glad to have something to do and avoid fights. After that, Zhang Yi sends Dr. Zhou upstairs to tidy the bedroom, leaving a thankful Yi behind. She whispers her thanks for keeping our secret just now. I already owe my cousin a lot, so if she finds out I'm competing with her for a boyfriend, she'll be heartbroken. Can we keep our relationship a secret from her? With only three people in such a large shelter, staying hidden won't be easy. Zhang Yi quickly agrees to Yami's request, wanting to show her gratitude for keeping our secret. Yami offers to cook for me, which surprises me. A big star knows how to cook? Yang Mi heads to the kitchen saying, don't assume all celebrities are useless. Actually, I find cooking relaxing when I'm bored. To her dismay, she finds the kitchen devoid of ingredients. It's the proverbial case of having no rice to cook. Even for a clever woman like Yang Mi, searching fruitlessly yields nothing. Watching her pace back and forth, I can't help but admire her figure. I walk up behind her and exhale lightly. Yang Mi stands up nervously, dodging back and glancing worriedly upstairs, her face turning red as she asks, What are you doing? Didn't we agree not to act like this? What if our relationship gets discovered? I smile, unable to resist her captivating presence. Then, I produce a heap of ingredients from another space and place them on the table. Yang's eyes widen in amazement. Oh my god, how do you have so much stuff? I can't believe my eyes. Food is so abundant even in this apocalyptic winter. It feels a bit too luxurious. I playfully pat Yang's hips. No worries folks, we'll be dining like this from now on. After Yang Mi calls me and Dr. Zhu to eat, I gaze at the spread before me with great satisfaction. Yang Mi and Zhou, however, seem to have different thoughts. Dr. Zhou tastes the bass and immediately wrinkles her nose, muttering about too much salt. Yang Mi eats her rice quietly, head down, feeling somewhat guilty, it's not easy to get the seasoning right under such circumstances. Meanwhile, I watch the scene unfold with an internal smirk. I'm purposely stoking a rivalry between the two women, knowing it'll ultimately benefit me. Without missing a beat, I pick up a dish with my chopsticks and feed it to Zhu, claiming it's less salty. She eats it up, immediately turning lovey-dovey. Food always tastes better when brother Y feeds it to me, she coos. As Yang Mi sits off to the side, I can sense her heavy heart. Later that night, Dr. Zhou nervously asks me, who's better, Yang Mi or me? She must have seen what went down in the kitchen earlier. Using my player-like acting skills, I reassure her, don't think too much baby, you're the one I love the most. Upon hearing this, the innocent Zhao immediately hugs me tightly, exclaiming, I knew it, brother why loves Dr. Zhu the most, but I can't help but think to myself, you really are naive. Despite appearing passionately devoted to Dr. Zhou, I've never truly been in love with her. Being with her simply satisfies my basic needs as a man. Love to me is just a disease that makes people lose their reason. For the past few days, I've been casually practicing shooting at Lark Manor when suddenly my phone rings. As I'm about to answer, I realize it's not a regular call but a dial tone, which is strange considering the electricity has been out since the apocalypse, and most of my contacts are gone. Curious about the unknown number, I mutter, even if you're a god, I can't be bothered, and promptly hang up, blocking the number. Oddly enough, within two minutes, the same number calls again. This time, I'm unnerved. What's going on? I blocked this number, I wonder. Thinking, maybe I didn't block it properly, I try again, but the phone rings once more. Now, I'm genuinely panicked. What the hell is happening? Is this some sort of haunting? Just as I'm freaking out, the call answers itself, and the voice on the other end starts questioning me. Despite my internal panic, I try to stay calm. This person on the other end is no ordinary caller compared to the riffraff I usually deal with. Before I can even speak, the voice on the other end starts rattling off detailed info about me, from my birth date to where I live. It's creepy. Who are you and how do you know all this? I demand. The guy, who I call fat bro in my head, just chuckles and tries to blackmail me for supplies. I can't help but laugh. You think you can scare me with that? I challenge him. But then he drops a bomb. He knows about the missing supplies from the South City warehouse. I try to play dumb but he's not buying it. And when he drops the name Lou Funga, a big shot in the info world, I freeze. This just got serious. Suddenly, a thought struck me. If this guy could hack into my phone so easily, what about the computer systems at home? Could he have hacked into those as well? But then I reassured myself that the probability was low. Like me, Lu Funga was also trapped in Lark Manor, limiting him to basic operations like hacking a phone. If he had compromised the computer systems at home, he wouldn't need to call and threaten me over the phone. Thinking quickly, I decided to play it cool with Lu Funga. Boldly stated, since you can support two women, you should have no problem supporting me as well. As long as you provide me with the supplies I need to live, I'll keep your secret safe. Additionally, I can help you maintain your cybersecurity to protect against other hackers. 
Smiling, I responded to Mr. Liu, you must be joking. I did work as a warehouse supervisor for a while, but a minor supervisor like me doesn't have much authority. But Lu Funga immediately fired back. Zhang Yi, don't try to outsmart me. I've been around long enough and seen enough to know that you must have those stolen supplies from the warehouse. I can gather a lot of information about you through your phone, leaving me fuming internally. Zhang Yi cursed inwardly at the old man's persistence. He knew he couldn't keep hiding the truth any longer. Admitting to having some supplies, but not many, he explained his limited living space and how he'd already sold off the excess. Lu Funga, however, seemed unconcerned with the quantity, only focused on his own needs. Threatening to expose Zhang Yi's secret and attract unwanted attention from people with special abilities, Lu Funga left Zhang Yi feeling the pressure. Rubbing his forehead, Zhang Yi realized he was facing a formidable opponent. Despite this, he resolved to confront Lu Funga once and for all. Reluctantly agreeing to provide some supplies, Zhang Yi warned Lu Funga to keep the secret safe. Lu Funga assured him that only they needed to know about the arrangement. He listed his requirements, food, liquor, cotton socks, and underwear, and instructed Zhang Yi to send them to Via 302 in Lark Manor. With a final warning against any tricks, Lu Funga hung up, leaving Zhang Yi to ponder his next move. I have a plan forming in my mind. This guy, Lunga, he's gotta go. I stride into the living room where Dr. Ju is lounging on the couch, take a big swig of water, and dive into the conversation. Hey, I've got something to talk to you about, I say, leaning in. I explain to her that our whereabouts have been discovered. I give her a quick rundown of Lunga's antics, how he's trying to blackmail me because he knows I've got a stash of supplies. Dr. Jo listens intently, her brow furrowing in thought. I've dealt with these types before, she says after a moment. They might not be the sharpest tools in the shed, but they're cunning, morally bankrupt too, typical businessmen. I'm feeling a bit lost. I really want to take this guy out, but I'm worried he's got a backup plan. The thought of being constantly blackmailed if I let him live, it's unbearable. If this info gets out, it could be a real threat to you. That's the tricky part. I remember hearing about corrupt officials taking out internet moguls to cover their tracks, only for the evidence to pop up online the next day. Shan's heard similar stories. Desperate folks always have a backup plan. They set up triggers to spill insider info if something goes south. That's why their enemies think twice about making a move. Dr. Joe tries to ease my mind, suggesting we don't dwell on it for now. But I can't shake it off. Until we solve this, I'll be on edge. The longer it drags on, the worse it gets. Then Yang Mi walks in, and I figure it's time to brainstorm a plan. After hearing the whole deal, Yang Mi's not thrilled. She calls it a headache. Creating rumors is easy, but debunking them? That's tough, she says. In the entertainment biz, we can't stand that kind of drama. Suddenly, a light bulb goes off in my head. You mentioned rumors, right? I say, getting excited. Yang Mi looks puzzled, but I've got an idea brewing. Isn't it ironic how spreading information about yourself can be likened to the unethical gossip that circulates about celebrities? Joe Ked seems to think so, suggesting that even if it's just a rumor, people will likely believe it, especially when it comes from Lu Funga. As I ponder this, I realize that while Lu Funga may have some information on me, it's not conclusive evidence. However, if this information were to get out, it could spell trouble for me. Since I can't stop him from spreading it, why not muddy the waters a bit? I decide to treat this situation as if it were just another rumor. Dr. Zhou and Yang Mi shoot me curious looks as I begin to formulate a plan. With a mysterious smile, I turn to make preparations. Heading to the control room, I call Lu Funga impatiently, asking if his stuff is ready. He laughs on the other end of the line, taunting me about my lack of supplies and threatening to expose my secret if anything happens to him. But I refuse to back down. Thinking quickly, I agree to his terms and promise to bring the stuff over. After hanging up the phone, a faint smile creeps onto my face. It seems like I've found a way to turn the tables in my favor. I switch on my computer and start posting threads on the remaining forums in Heavenly Sea City. I delve into the mystery of the Walmart warehouse theft, questioning if Walmart stole from itself or if the stock was moved elsewhere. I sprinkle in rumors of armed forces and police involvement, creating a web of sensational news to bury the truth in a sea of lies. Even if Lu Funga speaks the truth, no one will believe him amidst the chaos. Following Funga's instructions, I leave the prepared supplies at Lu Funga's residence. Once done, I discreetly retreat and take cover behind a pine tree, readying my sniper rifle aimed at the backpack left at his front door. When Lu Funga emerges to retrieve it, I'll take the shot, ensuring he meets his demise. With everything set, I send him a text message, the stuff is at your door. Zhang Yi keeps a close eye on the entrance, lurking in the shadows, waiting for Lu Funga to show up. But as time drags on, there's no sign of movement at Lu Feng's door, and Zhang Yi senses something's not right. Did the old man not receive his message? He hesitates to call or text again, worried it might tip Lu Funga off to his presence. Instead, he decides to wait a little longer, confident that the old fox will eventually come out for the supplies he promised. 
After about 15 minutes, the door to Villa 302 creaks open slowly, revealing a shotgun barrel poking out first, scanning for any threats. Then, cautiously, an elderly man steps out. Lu Funga, thinking he's finally getting his supplies, reaches for the backpack, but before he can grab it, a gunshot rings out. Lu Funga's head is hit, and he collapses to the ground, dead. Seizing the opportunity, Zhang Yi swiftly moves to Villa 302, aiming at Lu Funga's forehead and firing several more shots. You old bastard, he mutters, thinking you could fool me? Looks like you've had enough of this life. As I locate Lu Feng's computer, I see he's about to smash it with his gun. I pause, realizing the old man's computer likely holds valuable information. With a sudden idea, I decide to store the computer in an alternate dimension, preventing any data from being sent out. I sigh deeply, thinking, well, this is the best I can do. The man's dead. The stuff is taken. If he had family, I'd send them to join him in the afterlife. All this nonsense is over with. I'd rather go home and spend time with my two ladies and continue to be an internet troll, creating false narratives online. Even if information leaks out, I'm prepared to brazenly lie and frame others. My goal is to clear my own name by any means necessary. As I stretch and leave the control room, Dr. Ju asks with concern, Zhang, what have you been busy with? I've made you a soup with oxtail and kidney. Come have some. Once seated, both women surround me, offering massages. Feeling truly content with two women at home, I hope this happy life will continue indefinitely. Casually, I ask, did either of you receive any messages on your phones? Dr. Joe looks puzzled, saying, a bunch of jumbled messages. I don't know what they mean. Yang Mi also finds the messages confusing, perhaps intentionally misleading. Taking a sip of his fish soup, I explain that those messages were meant to throw people off track. I release them as smoke screens to cover up the truth. Now, I plan to flood every forum in Heavenly City with hundreds of similar messages sent to everyone's phones. Since I couldn't stop Lu Funga from sharing the real information, this is my alternative. Dr. Joe looks doubtful, wondering if this will raise more suspicion. Yang Mi agrees, concerned that suddenly bringing up the topic will attract attention. But as I calmly explain while eating a fishball, drawing attention is unavoidable. Whether or not I send these messages, Lu Funga's actions would have drawn attention anyway. By sending out these smoke screens, I can at least confuse things. Most people don't have the time or interest to distinguish truth from fiction. They just want to watch. Yang's eyes light up as she compliments my cleverness, confirming her judgment of me. She admires not just my looks but also my intelligence. However, Yuri raises a valid concern asking about the risk of someone tracking the IP address back to me since the messages were sent from my computer. She's right. Even if I used multiple accounts, my unique IP address could easily lead organizations to me, making me the prime suspect. Sipping my soup calmly, I notice Dr. Joe's reaction to the atmosphere shift and quickly apologize, realizing I might be overly concerned. She acknowledges the effectiveness of my approach, emphasizing that not many in Heavenly Sea City could counter it. Picking up some food with my chopsticks, I cryptically mention that covering my tracks entirely in this snow disaster scenario is nearly impossible. I never expected to fool everyone completely, but I aim to prevent most from suspecting me directly. I know encountering organizations with strong cyber capabilities is inevitable, and I've prepared for that. If it weren't for Lun's appearance, this day would have come much later. The shelter cost a whopping billion dollars, and is reputedly nuclear strike resistant. With my endless supply of food, I'd only truly worry if confronted by top-tier armed forces. I smile and glance at Yang Mi, reminding her not to be too complacent. Even though I'm confident in the shelter's defenses, I know we won't be idle in the coming days. Yang Mi's face turns a shade of red, and her shy eyes suggest she's aware of others present. It wasn't the best idea to discuss this in front of them. I was left speechless, wondering what was going through her mind. But Yang Mi seemed innocent enough, even though she hadn't been much help in other areas. I playfully smacked her on the head and said, I'm talking about setting traps. Holding her head with a look of innocence, Yang Mi replied, We don't know how to set traps. Standing up, I spread my hands. While this place has top-notch defenses, it lacks countermeasures against human threats. We need defensive weapons inside the shelter. So, I plan to set up a network of traps around the shelter. If anyone dared to target me, they'd find themselves in for a nasty surprise. Both women perked up at the idea. Ever since Yi's arrival, Dr. Ju had become more security conscious. They eagerly nodded, promising to do whatever it takes to keep me safe. Yang Mi chimed in, I might not understand traps, but I'll do my best. Nodding, I stood and retrieved a pile of hardware from another dimension. Most of it was steel nails and animal traps. Picking up a steel nail, I began to instruct them on its usage, reminding them to remember the trap layout. Dr. Zhou and Yang Mi realized the looming danger, and paid close attention during the lessons. Just scattering nails on the snow wouldn't do much to pierce anyone. I showed them my plan, grabbing a wooden board and adding spikes to it. Smooth steel nails wouldn't do the trick, so I brought out screws to make the spikes harder to remove. We needed about a thousand of these traps around the villa to cover all angles. Then, I introduced an animal trap, 
perfect for this weather. If someone got caught, they'd be finished. I explained how to set up the traps for maximum effectiveness. The women got to work enthusiastically making spike board traps while I surveyed the surroundings from the window. There were two crucial routes to our villa. I remembered the landmines I had stashed away. They could be strategically placed at those access points. These mines could obliterate tanks, so I had to be cautious around them in the future. Alright, so these spike board traps, while effective initially, can be pretty easy for an enemy to figure out. I needed something foolproof to make sure anyone who came near wouldn't leave unscathed. Yang and I got to work, setting up a bunch of spike boards. Her hands were all blistered from the hard work, but she didn't complain one bit. She knew she wasn't as skilled as Dr. Zhu, being a doctor and all, but she was determined to prove herself. I really appreciated her effort. Once we were done with the indoor setup, I took the lead outside. I showed everyone how to set up the traps, stressing the importance of getting the depth just right, especially with the snowfall making things tricky. Then, it was onto the vital pathways. I dug deep pits and carefully hid landmines inside, covering them up with snow. With a bit more snowfall, those traps would be practically invisible. But I wasn't done yet. I had to think about how to counter any sneaky moves from the enemy. That's when inspiration struck, I rigged up hand grenades with steel wires and buried them beneath the snow. If anyone stumbled across them, kaboom, it had set off a chain explosion. That ought to make anyone think twice about messing with us, unless there's some elite military unit. Approaching the shelter was a nerve-wracking task, especially with the exterior traps guarding it. Even if someone managed to bypass those, there was still a formidable defense corridor over 10 meters inside. But I wasn't too worried, I had a secret weapon up my sleeve, my spatial ability. Once back indoors, Yang Mi seemed eager and asked when the enemies would come. I couldn't help but look at her in surprise. You're actually hoping for trouble? I said, shaking my head. I'd prefer if these traps were just for show. But from your excitement, it seems like you're itching for a fight. However, I doubt anyone will attack us anytime soon. It's been ages since the apocalypse began. Surviving in your own turf is already a big win. No one's keen on stirring up trouble unless they absolutely have to. Yang Mi looked conflicted, unsure whether she wanted someone to trigger our traps or if she preferred the safety of our current setup. Lost in thought, she was suddenly snapped out of her reverie by a loud noise. Turning, she saw me using a welder to secure bolts on a door in the corridor. Curious, she approached me. What are you doing? She asked. Aren't these metal doors thick enough? The recent incident with LF had made me more cautious. As I worked, I explained, all the facilities in this villa are computer controlled. If someone hacks our system, they could easily bypass these doors. To ensure complete safety, I'm adding these bolts to finish the job, I stated seriously. Even if someone breaches the corridor, they won't get through these doors quickly. It's always better to be safe than sorry. Yang Mi looked at me with admiration, even though she thought my methods were a bit excessive. She believed I would undoubtedly outlive most. Reassured by our fortified setup, I only had one lingering concern. Cybersecurity. If only we had a cyber expert with us, we'd be entirely secure, I muttered. Upon hearing this, a sorrowful expression crossed Yi's face. Yang Xin Xin was pretty skilled in that area. It's a shame. Before Yang Mi could finish, Dr. Zhu interrupted. You know, is she still alive? Yang Xin Xin had always been frail, her legs paralyzed due to childhood polio. However, her mind was brilliant, especially when it came to computers. By 16, she had swept international computer awards and was considered a top hacker. As I listened to Dr. Zhou's account, I couldn't help but feel wistful. If we could find Yang Xin Xin, everything would fall into place. Yi shook his head. I lost contact with Yang Xin Xin a long time ago, especially after the snow disaster. I fear the worst. Teasingly, I remarked, maybe she just didn't want to deal with you after all. Apart from being pretty, you don't offer much in the eyes of geniuses like her who would seek your help in a crisis. Yang Mi, bewildered, playfully punched me in the chest, exclaiming, You're terrible, Zhang Yi. I felt a twinge of regret. If this young Xin Xin were still alive and could join our group, or more precisely, my harem group, it would be an excellent choice. Given the good looks of the two sisters, the younger sibling would likely be just as beautiful. Now, all that was left to do was wait. With this, the chapter concludes. Don't miss out on the next installment. Hit that subscribe button.